Disclaimer, this video and album will discuss difficult subjects such as domestic abuse, drug use, suicide, mental health, and addiction. If you or someone you know are being abused, please contact emergency services and speak up. Please take care. I had moved from Toronto to a smaller town. I didn't speak a lick of English, and I felt alienated from other students and teachers. I often stood on a hill and leaned against the fence and watched the other kids play during recess. It was lonely, but something about watching a mini society unfold every day for 30 minutes relaxed me. I would enjoy that alone time away from my abusive gaslighting father, escaping into my imagination that produced stories and images of superheroes fighting monsters, falling in love, and forming a found family. There was a boy my age I'll refer to as Shane who would listen to me sing songs by SR71. We especially loved the sweary parts of those tunes. Having no prior experience with drugs and sex, we didn't really understand what those songs were about, but they sounded great. He would ask me to come back the next day and sing another song, and I did. As we formed bonds with our separate friend groups, we would talk less and less until we didn't anymore. And I remember times he showed support for me in the classrooms and during performances for my Green Day cover band. My first day in elementary school, the first kid I met was named Julian. We got bored of our playground and I easily persuaded and probably manipulated him to come with me to the other school that was nearby. We played on their fancy spiraling slide. It was awesome. One of the kids from the school easily figured out that we weren't from there. Eventually the teachers found out and we probably got detention. I would often get detention, which I didn't mind, but the scariest part was worrying when my father found out and what he would tell my mom and what my mom would do to me because according to him, she was the enemy. This was a lie. Julian's family seemed fractured as well. No wonder we found each other, but we learned later in life that we were no good for each other. 2003, a new kid in school transferred. His name was Dana. We talked about Spongebob a lot and play fought during recess. Finally, I had someone to explore my imagination with. We publicly held hands and didn't feel anything wrong with that until almost every boy harassed us about it. It made me really confused. He and his family sacrificed a lot of time to help me grow and even had me play drums at their place. I would often walk over uninvited and be let in simply because it was just me. I noticed he had a Yamaha guitar in his room while he was watching One Piece. It was gross and rusty, but it sounded really beautiful. 2004, Julian would show up to school with Green Day's American Idiot CD with these handwritten lyrics on the liner notes. Our friend group comprised of us, Dana, Enzo, a really relaxed kid who swore a bunch. I liked him a lot and we would often play Naruto games together on the PS2. And Nash, who worked out a lot and requested recommendations for death metal to help him work out more. He was also a math whiz, along with Dana. I remember Julian singing Jesus of Suburbia a lot. Everyone else mentioned they had a copy of the album as well, which meant I had to give it a listen. I couldn't ask my parents to get me a CD like this, so I found it on the internet. I was immediately struck by how melodic and aggressive the songs were. At this point, I had listened to Linkin Park and SR71 and developed a love for rock. It was music for kids who had a lot of negative emotions to get out. Dana also mentioned his dad knew a friend from work who had a jam space with guitars, bass, and drums. I often practiced playing on paintbrushes and cans at his place and pretending to be a drummer. We played music together for the first time at this space. Green Day's Holiday was our song of choice. It felt amazing even though it was probably really rough to actually witness. I noticed our guitar teacher had a poster of Dookie hanging in his basement. We talked to him every week after we had practiced to get a sense of the scope of this band we knew as Green Day. Their legacy spans back to the early 90s. In the 7th grade, our teachers would nurture our spirits of rock and roll and oversee us using the music room and gym to play all these Green Day tunes until we were ready to perform in front of the whole school, all 700 or so students and staff. We played holiday to a bunch of kids from junior kindergarten to the 8th grade. We scared the crap out of the little ones. 
I feel bad about that now, but at the time, we felt like badasses. Inspired by the lore of Blink-182 and how they got their name, our band name derived from some of the band members playing Yu-Gi-Oh! and dropping the F-bomb 245 times. Yes, we were all really nerdy. We called ourselves Signet245. I wanted to impress some of the girls at our school, and we did. It was a wonderful time of my life, with this one Green Day album as the soundtrack to my time with these guys. American Idiot tells a story about an America with a government that cannibalizes its citizens. A troubled youth escaping a broken home, turning to drugs, terrorist culty activities, falling in love and eventually losing the memories of the one he had fallen in love with. It's a bittersweet story and a warning of what a bad society can do to its victims. How life is full of extreme fleeting highs and crushing lows, all performed by a bombastic pop punk band who prior to this album was in a desperate need to change up their approach to music and to dig deeper. The blunt political commentary and its empathy for a new generation of hurting young people struck a chord with listeners and audiences. Like what grunge and new metal did in the 90s, alternative wasn't so alternative anymore. Everyone seemed to be hurting, and this anthemic arena rock opera showed up at the right time and right place. Overnight, Green Day evolved from a struggling 90s act to the biggest band in the world with stage presence that was hard to match and other younger rock bands looked up to. This is the story of American Idiot and what this album means to me. The main guitar riff is an immediate earworm. What starts as a subdued, wimpy, clean tone quickly and subsequently explodes into a very loud and abrasive shotgun brick blasts of powerful rock music. Rob Cavallo's production really stands out in the 2000s from Paramore's Decode, Avril Lavigne's The Best Damn Thing, MCR's The Black Parade, as well as a bunch of Goo Goo Dolls records, and the majority of Green Day sound leading up to this point. This man's production has defined 90% of what I was listening to at the time, and it definitely wasn't a good idea to listen to these songs at nearly full blast on those crappy iPod earbuds that hardened when it got nipply outside in the brutal Canadian winters. Please be careful with your ears, folks. The lyrics describe an alarmingly relevant warning and plead to not be a part of an America that constantly ran biased idiotic news. With the president who cons the public into believing his lies, there's tension and polarizing left and right wing debates that alienate its people and the country's youth. The queer people who listen to these debates had been gaslit into believing that their queerness is a sin, something that I feel king for a day scribe Billy Joe Armstrong deeply felt at the time as a bisexual man. The album takes the left and rejects the redneck pride celebrated by older bands like Leonard Skinnerd during this information age of paranoia and hysteria, a call to action spearheaded by a highly provocative anti-right-wing millennial anthem. I wouldn't call it the best song on the album, not by a long shot, but it is a very effective, in-your-face way of starting the album. The best song of the album and Green Day's magnum opus is what comes after. This song's called Jesus of Suburbia. I'm the son of rage and love, driven by Billy Joe's ambition to make a bohemian rhapsody for a new generation, the song introduces the album's protagonist, an alienated, depressed, hedonistic, lonely lost youth living in a system of lies and make-believe that doesn't believe in him, making trips to iconic suburban landmarks such as a 7-Eleven parking lot a vandalized bathroom stall in said 7-Eleven, and a vandalized shopping mall. Home is where the heart is, is often used as a mantra to inspire. It's like a dollar store hallmark superficial Instagram post that's ignorant of the issues seen from a perspective of one with a broken home. How can that inspire hope in someone whose home corrodes their very being? It leaves them with shame for all the wrong they've done all the wrong they've experienced. 
The world is a beating heart, but his pulse beats out of sync. Not everyone has the luxury to subscribe to this deeply, dangerously romanticized definition of home. All around him are homeless children with the same dirty faces as his, and no one seems to care. Not even the person in the song cares. In fact, he says that 19 times. It also mentions how everyone and their parents are hypocrites. Your parents were raised by hypocrites who raised you to be one, and you continue this cycle of generational trauma and ignorance. Recycling all these ideas, never really saving anybody, even when you've died. It's pessimistic, cynical, and despondent. The album introduces binary concepts like rage and love, war and peace, Anaheim, California, and the Middle East to describe how the world works and what life is made up of. The blissful doo-wop sounding dearly beloved section provides us with a more nuanced analysis of juxtaposing concepts with the help of therapy, though it's unclear whether it's professional help or self-medication, demented, or disturbed, the nuances between insanity and insecurity, learning disability or overjoyfulness or in live versions, unemployment, and tales from another broken home. Jesus of Suburbia, who I'll from this point refer to as Joss, decides he's had enough of the hurricane of lies and a town of make-believe. He leaves what he had referred to as home to live and breathe and be part of the human race, to find the thing that he believes in, without shame, without apologizing, acknowledging that he's been a victim, and that he would rather find what else there is to life than to live the same days over and over again in the suburbs and die. The guitar solo in the song does what any great guitar solo would do. It's in the climax and it translates the melody of the song without overcomplicating or overly simplifying the song's musical ideas. The triplet steps up and stumbles down and cuts without any sense of resolution, a moment of contemplation that's not to be misjudged as hesitation. He's leaving home during this explosive and cathartic outro. The media constructs a world that ignores or demonizes anything different from the idealized right-wing message of success. It was relevant during the Bush era, and just as relevant now in a social media white supremacist, pro-AI, porn addiction culture that ignores the rights and safety of people of color, people in the LGBTQIA2 plus community, creative people who are trying to make art for a living, and the people who find themselves in a hellish cycle of addiction that only makes coping more difficult. You know, I was sober for five years, and then I thought that I could kind of go back and be like a, you know, just a normal drinker again. And then it just escalated. And it just got to a point where I was, you know, physically and mentally just drained and um i just felt terrible i got tired of i got tired of feeling tired but i've got a great group of friends that i go out with and we go see shows and um and we're still able to have a, a good sexy nightlife but we just do it without drinking you know the fact that i got up and was able to do this so early in the morning to come to your show is like and feel good right now um right. you know that's an accomplishment for me Society continues to find new all-time lows, and it's no wonder a song like this exists and continues to have such a powerful impact for those who listen to it. For two decades and counting, Jesus of Suburbia has been part of my DNA. It's the longest song that I had heard at the time. If I needed to wait 9 or 10 minutes, I would play the song in my head for walks, workouts, waiting in line, showers, brushing my teeth, commutes, cooking, you name it. The song strikes very close to home. I live in the suburbs in a town with no support for alternative music. I live every day in a claustrophobic room with an abusive bigot of a father and a hard-working loving mother who didn't believe or support my dreams of being a musician and an artist until the hospital visits happened. I would often self-medicate with edibles and alcohol, thankfully I don't drink anymore, and spend my time applying for jobs and being rejected. My life often feels miserable, and Jesus of Suburbia is a song that gives me hope when I've lost it. It kept me alive for decades, and inspired me to be a drummer, singer, guitarist, songwriter. I don't think I would be in a band as an adult if I wasn't in a Green Day cover band when I was a preteen. 
Jesus of Suburbia is one of my favorite songs and remains one of my favorite works of art. Green Day is not a subtle band. I'm not in the position to go line by line to tell you how the song takes a stand against America's war on Iraq and America's involvement in other countries. What I will do is tell you what the song means in the context of my life. parents were born and raised in South Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City, or Saigon. They didn't have the luxury to attend school when they were teenagers. My father mentioned when I was younger how he would sometimes have nightmares and flashbacks of seeing his friends die horrible deaths during the war. He also often bragged about how many men he had murdered as a soldier, how he met Jackie Chan one time, and how he said he could beat him in a fight. I thought everyone my age had a father as cool as he was. I was raised to trust, believe in stories from this autistic, traumatized war vet whose only philosophy in life was strength through violence. A philosophy that was literally inflicted onto him while he was a child by his own father. One day when I was a teenager, my brother, his girlfriend at the time, and I visited our grandmother and aunt from our father's side of the family. My brother and I were shocked to learn that most of the stories he told us were lies and grossly exaggerated truths. According to our aunt, he wasn't even a soldier and was terrified of carrying weapons to them. I didn't even know his birthday. Information was hard to come by in our family. Some of us are dyslexic and most of the photos they took were destroyed in a fire during the war. There was a reason why people at school felt uncomfortable talking to me. I was also a bigot, and I thought that was normal because that's all I ever heard at home and at the dinner table, in the living room, at family gatherings. I found it curious that no one really seemed to like my father. When this information finally got to me, the image of this man I idolized for a significant portion of my life shattered overnight. I've never hated anyone in my life, except for this one person who raised me, abused my mom, and laughed at me during my darkest moment, and recently had to call the cops on. Because of his actions, the actions of narcissistic men who ran these countries and continue to run these countries and decided to invade other countries, start wars and profit off of war, I lived my life as a broken person. I struggle to adapt to a healthier way of existing. A lot of days I feel like I'm a failure and a lot of days I make a lot of progress. The aftermath of war often leads to unforeseeable conflicts financial, interpersonal, psychological, even as a reason to start another war. We might never escape this cycle, no matter how hard we try, but we can make anti-war art that speaks honestly about how governments that form to serve its people often just serve themselves and do it for the money. We can make a song that's there for a confused and angry young person who needs it. A song that truly inspired me to pick up the guitar and bash the drums. A song like Holiday. After venturing into the city, the protagonist has realized that the only thing he can call home is the lonely and uncertain path he walks on. Lyrics that foreshadow the formation of his altar, St. Jimmy. The music sounds intentionally exhausted, repetitive, simple, moody, and the instrumental outro is the darkest and most nightmarish the band gets and probably has ever gotten. It sounds honest without glorifying the struggles of being unhoused with untreated mental disorders. <laughs> The song, Are We The Waiting, is a ponderous atmospheric anthem, guided by these spacious guitar arpeggios and Ringo Starr-like drum beats that takes place during the breaking point of Joss. 
I've always romanticized the song to be this optimistic arena rock tune that opens the door of possibility of what could be out there as an adult. All the adventures that one has yet to experience. Or at least that's what the music sounds like to me. I think it sounds really joyous and upon closer inspection, the lyrics tell a much darker story about a young man losing his mind and in a dying state similar to how one's memories begin to flash back moments before they die in a songwriting technique known as lyrical dissonance. In short, happy song, sad lyrics. Check out Train in Vain by The Clash and Hey Ya yeah by Outkast for examples. As he starts to die in complete misery and isolation, for survival, his body is forced to disassociate and switch to a dangerous altar. The self-proclaimed teenage assassin, suicide commando, patron saint of denial, the resident leader of Lost and Found, Saint Jimmy. Saint Jimmy goes hard and fast. The fastest song the band had at that point since Nimrod's Platypus I Hate You, seven years prior to American Idiots. An adrenaline-fueled riot led by a dangerous entity hell-bent on power and terror. A power that believes in this so strongly that he's basically the counterpoint of the extreme right all the way to the extreme left. A person that is attractive because of how threatening he is. And don't you fucking wear it out! Alright. Let's see. Give Me Novocaine is one of the saddest moments in the album. It's very bluntly about drug use and the addiction associated with it. A person being persuaded into escaping the anguish of the world briefly and relying on it to feel any sort of comfort. It's a song that was immediately gripping to me when I first heard it during a documentary segment of Bullet in a Bible. A song that sounded so blissful, accurate to being high now that I'm an adult who has been high. It's so full of heart, like an early Velvet Underground song. The saddest part is that it's his altar that's trying to convince him to keep doing drugs, and he seemingly gives in time after time. It feels even more relevant since Billy Joe had sought help. What I thought was simply a fable about urban decay has been real to me the longer I live. This is the song that I've been most anxious about seeing in person. I told myself that I would go to a show sober for once and let things wash over me, and I did. But more on that later. You are introduced to What's Her Name, a figure who's equally as badass as dangerous as Saint Jimmy, a saintly rebellious figure inspired by a woman Billy Joe was seeing who taught him a lot about feminism and activism. A woman who seems to be the embodiment of who Bikini Kill's rebel girl was about. And it's no accident that the person who plays her in the album is none other than Kathleen Hanna herself. Extraordinary Girl exposes the cracks to her persona as a flawed woman with just as much sadness weaknesses, and insecurities that Joss has. She's someone who falls in love with St. Jimmy, while Joss's feelings seem unrequited. But instead of crying into oblivion like a pet left in the rain, she gets sick of that and decides to take matters into her own hands. It's my least favorite track of the whole thing, with these vaguely exotic sounding Indian instruments. It's probably inspired by George Harrison's songwriting, and it's so predictable and repetitive with no real musical development. I never said this album was perfect. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh my god. <laughs> the magic of technology. <laughs> Sounds really, really good. Okay, well, let me just try it a couple times and then you can tell me what to do. What to change. Okay, do it as many times as you want.
Letter Bomb is one of Green Day's most underrated tunes. From the second I heard it, I fantasized about playing it with the band. The intro is sung by Bikini Kill, Le Tigre frontwoman, and influential ride girl icon Kathleen Hanna, used to taunt the Jesus of suburbia, similar to how children would chant na 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 to express superiority over others in the playground. I love the arrangement of that simple repeated 16th note guitar idea while the syncopated heartbeat drums and fluctuating bass lines sliding around these really simple notes makes this song take off. It describes the process of action during a crucial moment of societal change. It asks us where the rioters have disappeared to while the town they live in and its corrupt leaders eats them alive. By overanalyzing, we end up lazing around and dying a slow, painful death. The characters of the story, although fictional, are in real-life products of our society. This album wouldn't exist without the world being in the state of constant war, corruption, inaction, and action existing together. I love these brief moments of musical tension in the choruses that keep suggesting it's not your burden. It's not my burden. But I got news for you, it is. The story takes a turning point. She's done with him. And she leaves this burning town behind. to Billy Joe's late father who died on September 10th, 1982, when Billy Joe was 10. This track stands out to me and other listeners because it doesn't fit with the rest of the album's narrative, and also because it sounds too good to not be in the album. Try listening to American Idiot without this song. It just doesn't work as well. Like a lot of great Green Day songs, it's ridiculously simple, gets the point across, catchy as hell, what makes it notable is that it was the band's first power ballad as a full band. People love emotions. This song is emotions. Emotional song equals emotional people. Is this a power ballad? <laughs> I love this iconic guitar part, which taught me everything I needed to know about playing the same notes on different strings of the instrument. How you can let a string of a note ring even while another string is playing that note too, and going a step down, and doing this very pretty dissonance that I've incorporated into some of my own playing in my band now, and oh my god that drum part! It's so simple and has so much impact. It's as simple as it needs to be and the definition of a good drum part. At the time of Good Riddance Time of Your Life, a lot of rock fans abandoned the ship. Wake Me Up When September Ends is the extension of that direction that made the band pop and unapologetically cheesy. They had the guts to embrace their sound and were more ambitious with their arrangements whether it be a power ballad or a 9 minute rock opera. Speaking of... It's clear that in order to make the most popular albums of all time, Green Day needed to take notes from the OG most popular band of all time. The Beatles. The sequel to Jesus of Suburbia, set after a time jump and the other 9 minute epic of the album, Homecoming is to American Idiot what the Abbey Road medley is to Abbey Road. It summarizes all these ideas and motifs from the album. The idea of shame being this feeling formed by the streets of one's upbringing, drugs as a crutch rather than hope, St. Jimmy being an entity that can only exist in a screwed up town like this one, he argues that he's fucked up and we're not the same as the generation before us, and blames our parents. 
Although taken to the extreme, there is truth to how even with good parents, it's a universal concept that they mess up their children in many ways. Saint Jimmy dies from an apparent self-inflicted gun wound to the head. I don't know if the body of both Jimmy and Joss suffered this major brain trauma, or if it's an internal situation that happens within the mind. Years later, Joss has an office job filling out paperwork on East 12th Street. Anxious, lazy, and disinterested in his lifelike dream, like Neo in the Matrix and the narrator before he does the Fight Club thing. It was a common image during the 90s that seeped into the 2000s. This idea of a tired man in an office, sick of his soul's life. The creepy nobody likes you taunt from What's Her Name returns as an extended section sung by Mike Durnt. Delirious and addicted to coffee, he's alone, watching Spike TV and wishing for her to return. But of course, she doesn't. The weird Trey Cool section of him just being Trey Cool. Now let me go drop the kids off at the pool. And on a warpath of adrenaline, it's a really great way of portraying intrusive thoughts. It also suggests that Joss now has an ex-wife, a house, two kids, and haven't drank or smoked in almost a month. The Billy Joe section is set outside of the narrative and puts the real life back into our sights like Letterbaum did. We're listening to the album in a home or maybe at the edge of town. The town, the city, corrupt, and it gives us a lengthy chant to take it back. Home. We're coming home again. The Jesus of suburbia, out of frustration, getting sick of doing nothing and sulking, smashes his phone in the crowd and forgets her name. But we end with this inescapable taunt and the person who will haunt him to the end. I remember the face, but I can't recall the name. Now I wonder how what her name has been. What's Her Name is the epilogue of the story. It's like a breakup song that happens years after the breakup when the person singing has matured. After burning the photographs of her, he still remembers her face and not her name. He can no longer hold in the regrets, guilt, and shame he feels as the memories of their time together flashes back. He could never go back to that time and wishes to forget her but not their time together. The long ago section is so climactic and heart-wrenching. The way Go echoes, fades, and returns like a wave of heartbreak feels so real to me. At the time, our school had a spring dance where at the end of the day our band would perform a song by the Click 5 which was a very mid band in retrospect and a bunch of Green Day tunes that included Warning, When I Come Around, and What's Her Name and there were some girls in school I really wanted to dance with. I couldn't because I was in detention for not being able to complete some assignments on time. But even if I wasn't in detention, the person I wanted to dance with the most wasn't at the school anymore. And so playing these songs that day gave me some strange feelings of emptiness and I missed the snare hits. There was another kid who helped us do stage lighting. He punched my stomach really hard for messing up. I remember it hurting a lot, but not as much as missing this person and missing the dance due to my mental health, ADHD brain, family life, that all landed me in detention. I've had a few romantic relationships in my life, and they've all shaped who I am now. But there are times I'll forget someone's name. When a memory hurts too much, it's what my mind likes to do to move on and cope. Although we didn't date, the person who sticks out to me the most was this girl I'll refer to as Jane. It was no secret that I had a crush on her. I remember us never quite spending time with each other in person. We had different groups of kids we hung out with. She had to move away and had a going away party with some of her friends. The friends of hers I talked to mentioned that they were surprised that I wasn't there. We didn't get a chance to meet up to say goodbye. We talked on MSN almost every day for a while and to catch up on things at the school. I remember she gave me her birthday and told me to never forget it. To this day, I still remember it despite losing most of the memories I shared with this person during our adolescence. More than a decade later, we encountered each other in university. We politely said hi and asked how we were doing. I had to go to class, so I just went. 
and that was the last time we saw each other. Life and time had moved us to different points, and it somehow brought us back in this moment. This isn't a fairy tale with a romantic ending. I no longer had feelings for her. I was really happy and glad to have seen her again all those years later. I think the song expresses that adult feeling of revisiting a past relationship and not knowing how to really feel about it too well. The final stanza is ambiguous, yearning for a different outcome, yet perhaps words of someone who has found some peace in his life. And in the darkest night, if my memory serves me right, I'll never turn back time. bittersweet story of a boy's journey leaving home and having returned and missing the turbulence of his youth comes to an end. I've been feeling a lot of waves of grief and depression lately. In the span of a year alone, I thought my parents were both going to die. I've been in and out of hospitals, accompanying my parents and my partner. I haven't been doing well financially, and I felt as stuck as I was since 1999. These songs had often given me a space to feel the music, and I can't help but feel the political unrest in America and wars and genocide that rages all over the world. The only thing that has kept me alive are my relationships, my band, and music itself. While journeying to what was formerly known as the Sky Dome, I stopped by an IKEA for a budget-friendly lunch. They really skimped out on the peas and jam, but at least it was somewhat nutritious and delicious. Squish squish. Despite being alive for three decades, I've never been to the Sky Dome before. I don't watch sports and there weren't any shows that I was interested in that took place here. The shows that I was interested in were way too expensive and inaccessible due to Ticketmaster and Sculptors. One day I'll see you my queen bee. There was a person playing Wonderwall on the way to the gates. Did you know that Boulevard of Broken Dreams sound really similar to Wonderwall? You did? Did you know that Blue Jays are Corvids and their feathers are actually not blue. Enjoy that fun fact. Up to this point, the biggest venue I've ever set foot in was the Scotiabank Arena, formerly known as the Air Canada Centre. Don't you just love capitalism? The farthest I've ever been from a stage were nosebleed seats at the farthest row of a Radiohead show. There was a half second delay of when a drummer hits something to when we can hear it. No wonder it's notoriously hard to clap along to songs at these arena shows. Do you clap along to the visual cues of the band on stage, the cue of the screens, or the beat of the music that you hear? The delay on the screens matched the time of when sound reached us. But theoretically, if you were somewhere in the middle, what you're seeing on the screens and what you're seeing on stage were different. What do you do then? I guess just clap to the people around you and hope for the best? I ended up missing most of the Linda Linda set, but got to see them perform All In My Head, Oh, and arguably the anthem of their generation, RACIST SEXIST BOY. Also their bassist Eloise wore a shirt that said I love pho. Hell yeah. It was mentioned in some of their set lists that they performed the song Linda Linda, which they were named after, which is a Japanese punk standard from the Blue Hearts I first heard in the coming of age masterpiece Linda Linda Linda. It's a song I sang at karaoke, witnessed at a drinking boys and girls choir show as they were opening for Otoboke Beaver. The Linda Lindas make me so proud to be Asian. I feel so happy that they're on the same stage as Green Day, having so much fun. Next was Rancid, who had a really good set. Some of the songs meant a lot to me, and I generally had a good time, but it was quite uncomfortable seeing them to say the least. Then there was the Smashing Pumpkins, which I honestly forgot were on the bill. 
No offense to those who love them, I can see how they can be considered one of the greatest bands but I didn't enjoy their set that much outside of some of the Siamese dream and melancholy tunes. I had no choice but to be beside a super drunk bro who seemed really obnoxious and tried to start conversations with me mid-song and completely talk through homecoming and what's her name, completely ruining my experience for the latter half of the set. He was also really polite and disappeared for a lot of the set to go to the washroom after having at least four beers. I was annoyed and concerned. I really hate going to these mainstream arena beer shows because of this. If you're watching this video, feel free to responsibly have a beer, but just understand that the person beside you, whether they're a stranger or a friend, might not want to talk to you and is having a meaningful moment of quietly connecting with the music and the performers. If a song is playing and they're locked in, staring at the performers and singing along, bopping, ignoring you, take the hint that this is what they'd rather be doing than to engage in conversation with you. We also paid hundreds of dollars to be here for maybe a once in a lifetime chance to see songs that might not be performed ever again. At least not for the next 10 years that I can see Green Day going on tour again with these albums. Respect your boundaries and save your obnoxious conversations for after the set or during the lull moments between tunes. Please. Please. Then, after some Bohemian Rhapsody and the drunk bunny who appears to be quite sober, good for him, came the big daddy of the next two and a half hours, Green Day. Right out the gates, the five of the 15 songs off of Saviors and the Savior Tour sounded really great despite me not really caring too much for the album. The band continues to be hype as fuck, the energy of the three core members are still infectious and everything I imagined it to be. There might have been too many heyos that didn't work too well with the Dookie era tunes, but seeing someone like Billy Joe having that much fun, showing off that much genuine love and care for the fans and audience with this adorable smile on his face, cancels out that critique for me. This is something I brought up with one of my friends that I was messaging during the show. It was amazing to finally see Mike Durnt unleashed during the dookie hits like Chomp, Longview, although he plays that a lot, Welcome to Paradise, Pulling Teeth, Sassafras Roots, and when I come around, I wish he would go this hard on current songs instead of just playing the root notes. He's so underappreciated as a basses, and he's really, really, really good. He's really good basses. He also kind of resembles an ostrich, which is cool. I like birds. Did you know that it's highly unlikely that you can outrun an ostrich? Cool facts. Speaking of cool, Trey is a beast with so much energy off and on stage. I think my wrists would explode and my arms would fall off if I were to play a set like that every night. There were barely any moments when the music stopped and the interludes were done during the bridges in the songs themselves and the drums just kept banging. The most surreal moment of the show was him singing and dancing on stage to a string quartet arrangement of All By Myself which is a song with lyrics that a serial killer would write. And here's the backstory. I had headphones on, and I had a pair of uh, girls' underwear over my eyes. And I was, I was masturbating in, in my room. And when I finished, my dinner was at the foot of my bed. My mom had come and put my dinner at the foot of my bed. I, and so I wrote her this song. It's all by myself. But I wasn't all by myself. That's what makes it funny. <laughs> what an absurd trajectory for an absurd song. I love it. I was clenching my chest on the verge of tears for Jesus of Suburbia because Billy Joe changed the U's to Wee's in the outro was especially moving. Give Me Nova Cane was one of the toughest songs for me emotionally and seeing Billy Joe cheering with us and saying, let's do this together, gave me so much strength. Thank you, Billy Joe. Walking out of the stadium, among the chaos of the crowd, passing by cop cars, rickshaws, 
food stands, and buskers, I was feeling some conflicting emotions. A lot of it had to do with the depression and all the things in my life that break my heart. Maybe it's what being an adult is like. Most of the time, I find it difficult to truly feel free to be happy. And it hurts. It hurts so much. And I wish I could just go to a show and just be happy and stay that way. I miss the friends I had in Signet 245. I miss the people I thought about when I was first listening to these songs in 2004. Green Day briefly covered the Tom Petty song Free Fallen, which was a song that kept appearing to me during my commutes to the hospital. Life is random, and it probably means nothing. But as a human, I can't help but search for one. I don't have a full answer for this moment for why this song appeared again that night of all nights. At this moment making this video, I think it's just music reminding me that it's going to be there for me through the most devastating moments of my life and the most uplifting moments of my life. What I learned from therapy during a significantly lonely and alienating time in my life is that despite having people around you, all you have until the end of your life is yourself. I spent almost three decades of my life hating myself, not knowing who to blame and hurt, except me and those who tried to help me. In university, I remember a counselor suggesting that I take myself to a new place, to spend time with myself, to dance and sing with myself. My escape has always been the movies. Prior to that point, I've never been in a theater on my own before. I've always relied on the presence of others in order to feel joy. And so I took myself to see a matinee screening of Brave. Despite sitting around children who were quite disruptive and the quality of the movie being somewhat questionable, I felt empowered and at peace. Going to movies and concerts by myself is something I try to thoroughly enjoy these days. I don't know who's watching this, but I want you to know that you need to accept yourself. All your flaws, the things you're proud of, and the things that you're not proud of. Spend some time with yourself mindfully. There will be moments that you'll enjoy about yourselves and moments when you'll be okay. You deserve that. I love when artists have been at it for so long and have gracefully accepted their status as a legacy act. It was a celebration of all these amazing tunes that shaped pop culture and rock as we know it today. They've proven themselves as a band that helped to find not one, but two generations of pop punk and pop rock. Green Day is one of the greatest live bands I've ever seen in my life. Moments with Shane, Julian, Enzo, Dana, Nash, and Jane flashes back. I think having gone to the show, it provided some closure for these people that I never really had a chance to say goodbye to. People I was too afraid to say goodbye to. To any of you who've discovered this video and have watched up to this point, I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. What does Green Day and American Idiot mean to you? Let's make this video and comments section a safe space. If you want to help me make more videos like this, any amount of support would help. Whether it be through the Patreon where you can watch videos early, whether sharing the video, leaving a like and subscribing, or leaving a comment. I'm just happy that you're here. My band, Denise, in all caps, has an EP out called Guilt of Canada. We also have a new single out that you can watch, link to this video in description. If you like some catchy alternative metal, 
alternative punk, folky, prog, anime inspired tunes. I think you'd have a lot of fun with these tunes. We have a new album in the works with a lot of ambitious ideas coming to you soon, and I can't wait for y'all to be a part of that. I wouldn't have had the confidence to do this if I didn't have people subscribed already. I really appreciate that. I hope this band and music have generally given you a safe space to be yourself, to feel, to love, and to be okay with yourself. I hope to have you here again next time. Have a good day, and love yourself. Bye.